Today, Oregon OSHA's new coronavirus rules went into effect for Oregon employers of all kinds. It applies to any employer with one or more employees. That's everybody. There have been questions, lots of questions. Hence the reason for this special edition of Ask Alan Anything. We're gonna summarize the new rules and we are going to talk about five things every Oregon employer needs to do immediately. There'll be other, other requirements on businesses to follow in the coming weeks as various provisions of the rules go into effect. But for this video, when it comes to action steps, we're gonna focus on just these five. Hello, my name is Alan Thayer. I'm an Oregon business attorney. And over the years, I've also been an advocate for business. I've served on the board of directors of the United States Chamber of Commerce in Washington, DC. And in Oregon, I have served on the board and executive committees for both Associated Oregon Industries and then its successor, Oregon and Business and Industry. This has put me in a unique position during a time of constantly changing state and federal laws to advocate for business and then to have access to resources needed to answer businesses' questions. Ask Alan Anything started at the beginning of the pandemic to help business people with the many questions that are that have arisen during this uh, during a time that I don't think anyone has anticipated that there would be this many changes within this such in this short a period of time or that business businesses would face constantly changing regulations in a short period of time that's the reason for ask Alan anything and that is the reason why we are back today before we get started i do need to Notify you according to the Oregon Professional Liability Fund and the Oregon State Bar that this webinar is presented for educational purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice. And if you have specific questions to, um, um, if you have specific legal questions, then you need to talk to a lawyer. That out of the way. Last Friday, I published a a matrix of the new OSHA rules. Uh, I call this matrix a cheat sheet and it, and it is. It literally is the summary that I put together for internal use so that I could understand these new rules. And I've, I've done it for a number of other laws as well. And today we are going to use this matrix as part of our discussion. Now, hopefully everyone viewing this video has obtained a copy of the matrix. If not, there are links uh, below this video where, where you can download a, a copy of the matrix. There's no charge. You don't even have to leave your name or your email address. It is uh, available to all employers as an educational courtesy. One thing I may want to say about the matrix is it will be updated from time to time. If you would like to receive the updates the, down below, you also find a link to our legal brief um, email. It's just a, a free email newsletter, and we will use this email list to notify people of, of changes in the law, of new em, employer resources, and also updates to the matrix. All that having been said, let's begin. So when clients have called, I have pulled the matrix out and have gone through the matrix with them. And that's what we're gonna do today. Physical distancing. The first, uh, first area of the law for, or the rules for people to look at is physical distancing. Uh, maybe I should interject here at this point. If you look at the matrix, at the very top of the matrix, there is a link to get a copy of the complete OSHA rules. Uh, the rules are about 20, 21 pages, and then there's another 80 or more pages of appendix that go with it. 
Uh, that is a monster for people to go through. But when you look at the matrix, when you see the heading for physical distancing, underneath that heading, you will see a, a citation. It has the, um, the site of the administrative rule. And then there is a section at the end. So for physical distancing, the section is 3A. If, if you want to explore this topic further or any topic further, just go to the section listed for the particular topic that you want to explore, and you can see the rules there as OSHA drafted them. Okay, physical distancing. Employers are required to design their work activities and workflow to eliminate the need for employees to be within six feet of another person. That's not other employees, that's any other person. Now, physical distancing is something that you're probably familiar with, and maybe you have already taken these steps. Hopefully you have, but think through your workplace, talk to your employees and make sure you you redesign the workplace and the workflow to allow for this physical distancing. I, I've had clients uh, uh, today, a while on the phone, a client broke out the tape measure and was measuring the distances between desk and uh, their work area. Um, another client measured the distance from the photocopier to the reception desk to make sure there was six feet of distancing there. Now, you may have been one of those businesses that invested a lot of money in plexiglass to provide shields when employees could not um, be six feet apart from each other. Well, plexiglass doesn't work anymore. That's not what OSHA wants. OSHA wants six feet of distance. Now, there can be exceptions. But for those exceptions, you must demonstrate that for a particular activity, six feet of distancing is not possible. And any good lawyer would tell you that document your reasons why, why for a particular task, people cannot be six feet apart. Face coverings. How many people are tired of face coverings? I think everyone is. Now, notice I said face coverings, not mask. Um, a lot of people use the term mask interchangeably. I've been guilty of it. I think everyone has. But under the Oregon rules, masks are defined as medical grade mask. Uh, the type of uh, face coverings that most of us have are face coverings. They're not masks. So refer to face coverings as mask. No, no. Instead, see there, I, I blew it. Instead of saying mask, refer to face coverings. So employees must wear a mask or a face covering or a face shield. Now, OSHA and the Oregon Health Authority really don't like face shields, well, because they don't do much, but uh, they will allow employers and employees to wear face shields. If you're, if people are going to wear face shields, they want them to wear both a face covering and a shield. Uh, but that is not required at this time. We had a client call today and an employee is refusing to wear a mask, says it is difficult for her to breathe through the mask. Well, you have a duty to accommodate your employees under the Americans with Disabilities Act. If, um, if someone says they can't wear a mask, have them bring in a doctor's note, and then you must enter into what's called the interactive process where you talk to the employees, say, how can we accommodate your disability? The disability here, not being able to breathe through a mask. Here's what you cannot do, Oregon, the Oregon Health Authority, Oregon OSHA, they will not allow you to say, okay, because you have this disability, you don't have to wear a mask in the workplace. That is not an accommodation they will accept. You can uh, suggest that they wear a face shield. You can suggest that they wear one of those neck gaiters. Uh, the fabric on that is thinner than on 
on most of the fabric masks that we see people wearing. And I am told that they are easier to breathe. And, and I think they, they comply with the rule, at least at the moment. Um, employees must wear a face covering consistent with Oregon Health Authority requirements. Now, a few weeks ago, the Oregon Health Authority issued a new face covering um, guidance. And in the matrix, there is a link to that guidance. Also, if you check below, there are a number of links, including a link to the OHA face covering guidance. Vehicles. All vehicle occupants, when traveling for work purposes, must wear a face covering. Now, two things here. First of all, work purpose. If, uh, if six employees are piled into a car to commute to work, well, that's outside of your control. And second, when all the occupants of a vehicle are members of the same household, then they do not need to wear a face covering. So if they all live together, uh, they don't need to wear a face covering in the car when traveling for business purposes. There's a section on cleaning and sanitation. And this is, a, this is an area where I hope to bring in hope to bring in uh, an expert in the sanitation area to, to maybe uh, share some things with us that we might not consider. But think of your workplace. Think of every surface that people are touching. Those surfaces ought to be cleaned and sanitized. Shared equipment, high touch surfaces. If the workplace is occupied for less than 12 hours a day, then they need to be sanitized every 24 hours. If, if um, the workplace is used more than 12 hours a day, then they need to be cleaned and sanitized every eight hours. Hand hygiene is also brought into this area and you must supply, provide supplies, soap and water or sanitizer for employees to use to clean their hands. Employees must also be allowed to sanitize their workstation more frequently if they so desire. Here, you're responsible for providing the, the materials, the cleaning supplies, and you're responsible to allow them time to complete this other cleaning. There are additional requirements under the rule if a person who's known to have COVID has been in direct physical uh, contact with any surfaces or equipment in your workplace. Posters. Every new law has a new poster. Every new rule has a new poster. I, um, I guess it's a sign of, um, of the bureaucracy. It's a bureaucratic badge of honor if the work that the bureaucrat does requires a new poster. Well, there is a new poster that is required um, uh, for these under these rules. That poster is included with the matrix. So if you download the matrix, you can you will have a copy of the poster. You'll have both the English and the Spanish version of the poster. If um, but also there are links to the posters down below. The poster must be must be uh, displayed in the workplace. And then for those employers, employees that are working remotely, uh, you need to email or text those, uh, those uh, text the poster to those employees. So a lot of employers tell me that for their office, for their office workers, they have email and for their field workers and their their production workers, maybe all they have is a cell phone number. If all you have is a cell number, um, copy the link below and text that link, both uh, both the English link and the Spanish link to your um, remote employees. All of these provisions that I've discussed all went into effect today. A week from today, the, uh, November 23rd, next Monday, 
building operators, those who those employers who operate or control buildings where employees of another employer work, um, have have a few requirements. One, they must be they must make sure that the sanitation requirements are met in the public areas of the buildings, the elevators, the lobbies, the bathrooms, uh, break rooms, any any public area. Also, Oregon Health Authority previously published a mask required sign. If uh, you control a building, make sure that mask required sign is posted at the entrances to the building. Now, uh, that mask required sign is included as part of the matrix download package, but also a link to that sign can be found below. Ventilation requirements. Okay, come January 6th, there are requirements for the air that moves through your building. You must optimize the air circulation through your existing HVAC system, according to the manufacturer's instruction. Now, it does not require you to buy new equipment. And I, I am aware of employers that have bought various HEPA air filter, uh, air filtration devices. Great. Good for you. But that is not required. What is also required, though, is to maintain and replace all air filters and clean and maintain all outside air intake ports pursuant to the manufacturer's instructions. Now, this deadline is not till January 6th. Um, I do hope that we can bring in an HVAC expert to discuss what this uh, aspect of the rule provides or requires. Okay, here's a big one. By December 7th, you need to complete a risk assessment. If you have one or more employees, you must complete this risk assessment. This is something that we're going to go into more detail in a future video that, because this is important. Between now and then, though, um, there is a link in the matrix to an OSHA template for evaluating risk assessment in your workplace. And you can uh, take a look at that and get started. You need to involve your employees in this discussion. And in the future, we'll talk about how to do that. But there is a big liability trap here for the unwary. Should you ever be sued over a, a COVID-19 exposure uh, lawsuit, the very first thing the lawyers are going to ask is for a copy of your risk assessment. Let's talk about that. There is a way to protect that risk assessment from disclosure under the attorney client or the lawyer work product privilege. We'll talk about that further, but just keep that in the back of your mind. Now, if you have one or more employees, you need to conduct the risk assessment. If you have 10 or more employees, you must, you must document that risk assessment in writing. Uh, once again, that goes into effect December 7th. Uh, but we're going to be we're going to be talking more about that in the future, together with the risk assessment. I know you're not supposed to touch your your face. With the risk assessment, there's also an infection control plan that is required. So once you've identified the risk, what are you going to do to prevent infection? This also is due on December seventh, and if you have ten or more employees, then your infection control plan must be documented in writing. We'll talk about that in the future. Employee training. Not only does OSHA want you to do all these things, but they also want you to train your employee on whatever it is they want you to train. A little vague here because OSHA is supposed to provide training materials. We haven't seen them yet. When those training materials become available, we will distribute those materials on our legal briefs email list. Another reason to subscribe. 
after those uh, after the OSHA training materials are available, we may very well do a video on that as well. Now, here is a another liability trap for the unwary. The OSHA training requirements assumes that employers conduct regular safety meetings. Employers in the manufacturing area and the, con the construction in the area and uh, uh, certain other fields regularly hold safety meetings once a month or more. Other employers, particularly those in office settings, um, probably are not conducting safety meetings. And you're not alone. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of Oregon businesses that do not regularly conduct safety meetings. If that describes you, then you need to consult with a lawyer to make sure that you start complying with the safety meeting requirement. I, I, I think this is an area where OSHA is going to be taking significant action. So, so beware. Okay. The, I think I may have mentioned that the, the training must be completed by December 21st. If I didn't, then, then here it is. The training must be completed by December 21st. As of today, November 16th, you must have an infection notification policy. Well, you're in luck. There is a sample infection notification policy published by by OSHA. In fact, all you really need to do is copy and paste and change a few words to make it fit to you. And that can be your infection notification policy. We're going to talk about this again in the action steps, but this is an easy one to check off the list. Testing. Effective today. If, uh, if the state health authority or a local county health authority says that they want to test employees for COVID-19, you need to make the employees available. And if they request, you need to make space available for testing. If you decide that you want to have your employees tested, uh, that's fine. You can do that but then you are going to be responsible for the testing cost. You're going to be responsible for the employee time. And if the employees must travel to a testing site, then you are responsible for employee travel. Otherwise, if the health authority requests the test, you as the employer are not responsible for the test cost or employee travel. Medical removal. Um, affected today, but it's been in effect for anyway. If um, health authorities direct employees to isolate or quarantine, they must be removed from your workplace. When they're allowed to come back to work, you must return them to the position they had uh, before they left work if that position still exists. Um, also, you may be required to pay federal leave while they are out on quarantine. Um, back in, I believe in March, a federal paid leave provision was enacted by the United States Con Congress. That is another one of those complex laws where we prepared a cheat sheet or a matrix and, and shared that with others. There is a link to that matrix in, in this matrix. And there's also a link to that matrix uh, down below. Okay, we're, we're uh, near the end here. Various industries have industry specific requirements. And the rules for those indu industries are set out in an appendix. Um, the construction industry, the uh, um, um, oh, my, I'm drawing a blank here. The construction industry, the the people who are involved with uh, uh, gyms and swimming pools and 
a lot of industries are listed. We have set out the list of specific industries in an appendix to this matrix. So uh, when you download the matrix, take a look at that appendix and see if it applies to you. And if it does, go through those those specific rules that apply to your industry. I, I've been going through those the last few days. And for each industry, we're only talking five or six pages. So there may be 80 pages of, a, of appendix, but you won't have to read through all of that. Also, there is a whole new set of requirements, additional requirements for what are called exceptional risk workplaces. Now, except, exceptional risk workplaces are uh, people dealing with patients, uh, people dealing with uh, uh, mortuary procedures, uh, uh, EMS type people. There is a, also a list of exceptional risk workplaces that are part of the matrix download. Take a look at that. We're not gonna get into that, but if it applies to you, then there is a whole new set of additional requirements. Now, we released this matrix on Friday. Also on Friday, the governor uh, came, uh, had a press conference and said that she's going to lock down the state again and uh, certain, certain businesses won't be able to continue to operate. What are the rules? We don't know. The lockdown goes into effect on Wednesday. Here it is. It's it's Monday night, and the rules uh, have not yet been been issued. I had a client call today with a very unique set of circumstances and trying to determine whether whether he can operate a certain facility or not. Um, I've been through the OSHA rules. I've been through the governor's press conference. I've been through Oregon Health Authority guidances. Um, his facility really seems to be an outlier. Um, hopefully we will get an answer for him. A request has been made to the governor's office and, and hopefully they will see the reason why his situation is different. Um, I'm just glad that we were able to put that request in, in for him. Now, I promised that we would have action items for you to take away from this video. And these action items are important. They, they need to be done immediately. If you haven't done these things yet, do them now. So the first action item is the physical distancing requirement that we mentioned at uh, the beginning of the discussion. You must review and redesign your work activities and your workflow. You must document any exceptions. We talked about exceptions. And you must communicate your physical distancing plan to your employees. Second thing, face coverings. We talked about face coverings. You're probably already complying with that. Um, but there is a link to the Oregon Health Authority requirements, and you need to communicate your requirements to your employees. I have a client today who called because a, an employee says she cannot wear a mask. Well, okay, we'll engage in the interactive process. Uh, maybe she can wear a gator, maybe she can wear... I don't know, maybe we talked about this. Maybe she can wear a gaiter, maybe she can wear a face shield. Um, or with her particular job, it may be possible to move duties from um, inside to outside. That's not possible for every employer, but it may be possible in this instance. The employer must meet with the employee, engage in the interactive process, and by meet, the meeting might be virtually today through Zoom or something else, but. Um, um, just not wearing a face covering will not work. I know I'm repeating myself, but that is an important one. Sorry about this little, um, little flash in between slides. Cleaning and sanitation. Need to adopt a cleaning and sanitation policy. 
Yeah, you need to designate who it is that's responsible. Is it an outside cleaning service? Is each employee required to, to clean their work, work area? Um, are you going to have employees designated? You need to lay that out. You also need to obtain cleaning and hand hygiene supplies. For cleaning supplies, I believe there's a reference to an EPA list of coronavirus cleaning supplies. And we have a link to that EPA list below. Uh, another thing you need to, to do immediately is display a poster. As discussed, the, there's links to posters. The posters are included with the matrix download. And to remote employees, you need to send this by email or text message. And your fifth immediate action step is the infection notification policy. Um, you have the sample policy with the matrix download. You have a link to the sample policy below. And then once you adapt that for your use, communicate that to your employees. We've covered a lot. Uh, and there is a lot to cover. There are a lot of questions that are coming. When, when we don't know the answer to a question, we're, um, we're dedicated to finding out. Uh, we'll contact OSHA. We will contact the governor's office. Um, employers need help. And if you think that, uh, if you think that it looks like employers are, are being saddled with the burden of trying to end this pandemic, I think you're right. Before the governor's new two week, and I guess two weeks probably ought to be in air, court, air quotes, before the governor's new two week um, um, shutdown or slowdown or whatever she's calling it, um, the night before she met with three business leaders. Uh, I know all three of them, I know two of them very well. And during that discussion, I am told that the governor acknowledged that the increase in, in COVID infections are not coming from workplace exposures. They're coming from social exposures. But nevertheless, they're cracking down on employers and we need to, we need to comply. So thank you for your time this evening. If there is uh, anything we can do to assist you, do not hesitate to call. I welcome your questions and comments. And um, we will be back delving into some of these issues in more detail in future videos if those videos help you. Between now and then, though, if you, if you like this uh, video, if it was helpful, please give us a thumbs up down below. Uh, if you'd like to share a comment, uh, please do so. That would be appreciated. And you can subscribe to this YouTube channel, um, as well as subscribing to our legal brief list. There will be information shared by email that will not be shared through this YouTube channel. Thank you, everyone. Good luck.